I think you're right. There is, certain, there is a pleasure when you go on holiday. There is a pleasure when you engage in the physical act of sex. There is a pleasure when you eat something nice. But this is the pleasure of the senses. This is the pleasure of the mind. But what we're opening up for you is the opportunity of the pleasure of the soul. The pleasure of that which is beyond the material experience. Mm. Now, the only way you will be able to experience that is if you have an open mind, if you're ready to explore. You got nothing to lose, but you got everything to gain. So why not give it a try? ask me questions like uh, yeah as though he is a little uh, skeptical he may ask some controversial questions and uh, all of you can help him <laughs> so you can challenge us there are no uh, barriers here there is nothing that you can ask that would be too controversial in fact, the more controversial, the more challenging, the better. <laughs> so feel free, and like this we can have a deeper exploration. You can also help me if you like as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now <clears throat> I'm going to enter the part of the atheist, the journalist. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so, I understand that we're here with a monk from the Hare Krishna tradition, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity for me as a journalist to interview you. Uh, nice to meet you, Keshava nice, Swami. Nice to meet you. So, I understand that you are a monk. Would you would you introduce yourself? Yes, I am a monk. I'm also a student. We're continuously learning more about spirituality. But after I finished university, when I was 21 years old, I looked at the world and began to consider what I wanted to do with my life, with my time in this world. And I felt as though exploring spirituality and sharing it with the world in the most relevant way would be a beautiful contribution to make. So when I was 21, I became a monk. And, uh, and that means uh, I'm celibate. Celibate? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I live as a celibate monk and... Uh, wait a we second, live... okay, wait a second. Okay, sure. Yeah. So... Um... This is interesting. This is, um, I think this is something I've never heard before, something I've, I've never met before. So I'm curious, how old are you now? I am f uh, coming to 42. You're coming to 42. So yeah. you've been celibate for almost 21 years mm -hmm. um, as a monk. <laughs> In, okay, okay, I understand. And uh, would you... Would you tell us a little bit why celibacy? Why is celibacy important or necessary to yeah. be a monk? Well, the first thing I'd say is that not all Hare Krishna practitioners are completely celibate. Some get married and they engage in sexual union, physical union for the purpose of having children, which is the natural outcome of that physical act but in essence what we understand in spirituality is that control of the senses control of the senses and control of the mind and the passions of the um, mind and senses if we're able to control that then we're able to gain a greater freedom to explore much higher aspects of life yeah? Okay. So you have to understand that control 
and freedom are not opposite. When you drive in a car, do you stop at the traffic lights? Yes. So someone's controlling you? I wouldn't say someone's controlling me. I want to stop. Okay, and why do you want to stop? Because I don't want to break the rules. I'm aware of the consequences if I did. Exactly. So if you would not stop at the traffic light, if you'd not accept that restriction and you break that restriction, in the long term you'd have a car crash or something like that and it would break your freedom in a bigger way, right? Yes. So correct. in the same way we control our mind, we control mm. our senses because if we let everything just go wild, mm. then later on we'll end up more entangled, more restricted. Right, correct, correct. You understand? That's, yeah. that's, um, that's what I don't like about religions, um, if I may speak frankly. You understand, uh, religions, they force you not to have pleasure, not to feel pleasure in this world in the name of uh, not breaking certain rules. And probably religions also, they make you feel guilty when you break those rules. So I believe you would feel very guilty if you had sex. And... Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, my question, my provocation, perhaps. Um, but wouldn't you, you accept in life that we always have to give up one pleasure in order to get a greater pleasure? When you were a child, did your parents tell you to stop trying you know, for a certain type of pleasure? Because ultimately they wanted you to experience a greater pleasure later on. So religions are not trying to stop you from pleasure. Religion and spirituality is not meant to stop you from happiness, but rather is meant to help you to get the greatest pleasure, the greatest happiness. But in order to do that, you have to restrict, as we see in every, uh, in every aspect of life. Mm. Restrict, restriction. I know, I, I think you're very clever and you're very good at speaking and uh, <laughs> uh, I, I like the way, I like the way you, yeah, your arguments are very nice and they, they kind of make sense, but still, I believe Marx, Marx, mm. greatest thinker, one of the greatest thinkers of last century, he said that religions are the opium for the people, Ma opium something like that. Opium for the masses, yeah. Opium for the masses. And I can see that in what you're saying. I still, I don't think uh, you proved me wrong with your explanation. You just convinced me, or you tried to convince us that we should give up pleasures. One of the nicest pleasures, like having sex, or mm. having a nice car, well, We perhaps. want to prove it to you. You want proof? No. <laughs> We want to prove it to you. You want what? proof? No, I like, you don't I like want sex. Proof. I like sex. No, but I, like but, yeah, but I want to prove it to you. I want to prove to you I there's see, something higher. I see that you want, me to, you want to convince me and you want to convert me into Hare Krishna, perhaps. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> I don't want to convert you to Hare Krishna. I don't want you to change your religion. I don't want you to uh, shave your head and wear saffron robes. Although it's nice, if you want, you can, no problem. But we want you to be happy. So we I'm are offering you a higher type of happiness. I'm already happy. But I've done your happiness and I've done spiritual happiness. But you have only done material happiness. You've not done spiritual happiness. So why don't you try both and then make a decision? How long shall I try it for? Well, one month. One month. <laughs> Think about it, you can come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it. I mean, I have to be sincere. I, I, yeah, I don't good. like yeah, you. You should I, be sincere. Yeah, I want to be pleased. And you also feel free to, to speak frankly. And I, I, I like you, but I don't like you. Because what you say, what, else, what you say, it's 
completely against everything I believed in all my life and I believe in right now. But at the same time, I can see you're very happy. Your smile, <laughs> your aura, your, your, your humility. So, um, even though I don't like you, I, I'm interested in what, you, what you're saying. So let me get this, um, let me see if I, get, um, if I get this right. You're saying that, uh, that your religion, if I can call it this way, is something that I have to prove to understand, that I have to practice in order to understand. Yeah, what we're sharing with you is not so much a religion, we're sharing with you a spiritual science. Did you, yeah, spiritual science. How can science and spirituality go together? What I learned in school is that on one side you have religion and on the other side you have science. One is rational and one is irrational. <laughs> and now you're talking about spiritual science? Well, the first thing I want to tell you is that some of the most greatest scientists of all time believed in God. They were spiritual. They had a divine uh, a conception of life. Really? Yeah. I One, they... Like, for example, Louis Pasteur. He once said, all I'm doing by all my scientific research is finding out how God did his work. So in this world, people create an aggressive demarcation between mm. science and religion or science and spirituality. But if you look a little bit closer, then you can see that they are actually working together and that there can be a synthesis. Science improves things. Spirituality improves people. So we, it's not that we don't like science, it's not that we don't want science, it's not that we don't appreciate science, but science is functioning within a certain realm and spirituality is functioning in a certain realm and they can be synthesized, but not replaced because they're dealing with different things. Yeah, okay, but science only deals with those things that can be measured and theorized, and they make sense. You can write a theory, you can, re can reproduce it. Okay, so what is the that science? That doesn't happen with spirituality. You cannot prove that God exists. I can prove that at 100 degrees of temperature, the water will boil. To start boiling, right? This is science, it's scientific, there is evidence. We like evidence. Have you ever conducted that There's experiment? There's no evidence. Have you ever conducted God. that experiment yourself? Every day when I cook pasta and pizza, <laughs> when I, I, <laughs> I, I turn, I boil the water. At and you've degrees. checked that 100 degrees it boils? Yeah. You've done that, yeah? And how it's evident, how, evidence. We're talking evidence now. Can you be sure that the mercury in the thermometer is actually mercury? Have you tested it? Not myself. Not yourself. So I'm, you believe it on the basis of what someone's told you? Yes. So even you're saying it's science, but you've never actually done that experiment yourself? Not myself. Yeah. So the first thing is, you already believe in things that you have not proved yourself with your own hands. Still, Agreed? it's evident. Agreed? Agreed, okay. Agreed. okay. So, we're saying the same thing, that all we're asking you to do is put a little bit of faith in this spiritual process. The scientific process is hypothesis, experiment right that's what i'm talking conclusion. about yes yeah. science yeah evidence yeah so i'm giving you a certain hypothesis of life that you are a spiritual being that there's a supreme spirit and that there's now an experiment called yoga meditation spiritual practice and if you engage in that experiment you will get an observation of certain things which will happen and change in your own consciousness that will prove to you that this is not just some belief, but this is a tangible spiritual experience. Okay, this... But you have to engage in the experiment. Yeah, but who tells me that you're not tricking me into something that then will convert me or convince me that uh, you are right? You can't ask for the proof before conducting the experiment. That's not how science works. Mm. 
You're very clever. <laughs> um, okay. How do you know, why are you not so as worried that the textbooks in the school are not tricking you? Why are you as worried when you go into a lecture and they tell you the world came from a big bang? Why are you not as worried that they're tricking you when they say that? You have such an acceptance of things in the world, but when it comes to spirituality, you're not willing to give a little bit of faith to explore. That's not rational. That's not uh, scientific. Hmm. I have to say, I like the, I like the fact that you, you, you understand spirituality as a science. This is new to me, new to me. When I grew up in Italy, I, was, I wasn't told this. I was told, you have to believe this. There's no evidence. Just take it as it is. Don't question. Don't think about it. But now you're offering me a different approach, so I have to say, even though I don't like you, because <laughs> uh, still, what you're saying is appealing. Uh, spiritual science, you were saying. Spiritual science. Okay. And uh, I don't have to believe in anything unless I test it and I prove it right. Become a spiritual scientist. How to become a spiritual scientist? First thing is, uh, adopt some of the spiritual practices, associate with the spiritual people, learn the spiritual theory behind all of these things that we're talking about, mm. and try to uh, undergo an experimentation of transforming your own consciousness. What can be more exciting? What can be more adventurous? What can be more life-changing than that? It's a, great, it's a great opportunity. I don't understand. No work, no money, no sex, no cars, no football. Where's the fun? Where's the life-changing experience? Where's the adventure? The adventure is not the adventure of the outside world. We want you to take the journey within, the inner adventure. Give it a try. Inner adventure? What is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you won't know unless you try. I just like to go on holiday and visit places and have a drink, have nice food. And would nice you say food. those pleasures are limited? Would you say those pleasures ultimately bring you a sense of satiation where you feel yeah. like you need to change, you no. need to do something else? You need to go to a different place. To be or a honest, food. I'm happy. I'm happy with. I'm happy with my life. I'm satisfied. Do you think you could be more happy? <laughs> no. No, you don't think I'm, you could be more happy. I'm satisfied. I think I'm great, <laughs> and my life is great. <laughs> I know. I know what you guys do. You you make feel people inadequate. You make feel people like they need God. You make, feel, you make people feel they need God. You make people feel they wrong. So they buy, what do you say? No, we don't And I think, think well, that's wrong. what you're trying no, to do with no, me, no, no, no. honestly. I like you. I also like you. Mm. <laughs> I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're bad. I don't think you're misguided. I think you're you right. I think you're right. There is, certain, there is a pleasure when you go on holiday. There is a pleasure when you engage in the physical act of sex. There is a pleasure when you eat something nice. But this is the pleasure of the senses. This is the pleasure of the mind. But what we're opening up for you is the opportunity of the pleasure of the soul the pleasure of that which is beyond the material experience. Mm. Now, the only way you will be able to experience that is if you have an open mind, if you're ready to explore. You got nothing to lose, but you got everything to gain. So why not give it a try? Nothing to lose. What about my pleasures? <laughs> what about 
cars and sex and all of this. Are you saying that I should give that up? I'm not asking you to give it up for the rest of eternity. I'm saying give it an experiment for a certain amount of time and okay. see how you feel. What, 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 would, what would you say, guys? Shall I, <laughs> shall I, <laughs> shall I give it a try? <laughs> <laughs> for a month. <laughs> Ask them, maybe they have questions. Do you guys have any questions? I'm, I'm a bit confused by now. Please. So he's teasing you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know, please. Good. That's what we want, please. <laughs> No, please, please. This is good. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you for being brave. You can give a round of applause. <laughs> that we yeah. These are exactly the kind of things we want to bring up. Um, so the first thing I would say in response is that you're absolutely right. Um, these bodies that we have are temporary bodies. I'm man in this body. Maybe I was a woman in a previous life, and maybe a man before that. We're all going through different dresses. So in one sense, yes, on a deeper level, we're not man, we're not woman. We're all spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, we all want to have spiritual relationship and spiritual love. That's the goal. <laughs> what happens is that while we're in this world, because we've not fully disassociated from our identities, um, I sit in front of you as a teacher, but that doesn't mean I'm a pure spiritual being. I'm still on my journey. I still maybe identify with myself materially. I don't come in front of you claiming like I'm a self-realized soul. I'm on the journey. We're all on the journey and we all haven't become pure yet. And therefore, there's a certain amount of uh, 
I guess, a precaution that we take in associating. Perhaps the attraction between man and woman is the most powerful attraction in this world, isn't it? We have all the stories of how you know, very, very powerful people, ultimately, they even fell prey to that passion because it's so powerful. Yet the attraction between man and woman um, in a material way is a reflection actually of the pure love of the spiritual world between souls. So the whole practice of spiritual life is to turn lust into love. That's what we're actually trying to do. We're trying to come to that point where eventually we look out at the room around us and we don't see bodies. We don't see man or woman, but we just see spiritual souls. But until we reach that level of spiritual accomplishment, we take some precaution to keep a respectful distance from each other. But that doesn't mean we can't have exchange. That doesn't mean we can't have conversation. Um, by all means, you can come over and have a conversation. That's not a problem at all. Um, but yes, there may be some uh, distance which is uh, encouraged so that um, we don't again fall into the trap of seeing each other as material. So therefore, yes, there is some uh, restriction, some separation that is there. But on a higher level, ultimately, yes, we are trying to transcend that. So when you see separation, don't feel that it's a disrespect or a devaluation, um, but rather it's, it's the exact opposite. It's a sign of great respect for each other, that I respect you in you, your journey, and you respect me in the other person's journey, and we want each other to do the best we can. And so by all means, let's have friendship, let's have spiritual association, let's inspire each other, and let's also be a little bit cautious because let's not be so confident to think that we are above and beyond all of this. We may still become uh, implicated in material thinking again. And when we don't want to do that um, because it will impede our spiritual journey. Um, does that? You can, and you can also come back to me and tell me, yeah, that sounds good, that doesn't. Does that help a little bit? In, yeah, so... It just tricked you. It just tricked you and made you believe. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that question. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Overcome it. Yeah, really good point. Very good point. Good point. Yeah, very good point. Um, Thanks. What we're saying is not that you will overcome the attraction for the opposite sex by se separation. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that separation from the opposite sex allows you a certain amount of breathing space in the mind for you to then engage yourself deeply in spiritual pursuits and then the elevation of spiritual consciousness is what then gives you that 
freedom from uh, material attraction. <coughs> so all that's happening in the separation is you're giving yourself some time, some space, where you're in a kind of, yeah, I guess somewhat of a safer environment, which is less um, uh, agitating maybe for your senses and mind, so that you can fully absorb yourself in spirituality. And it's ultimately the higher spiritual taste, it's the higher spiritual vision, it's the elevation of consciousness that then means you can see um, someone of the opposite sex and not be um, seeing them in any way material. It's not that we're saying that just by keeping a distance from them. Because you're right, if we just avoid each other for the rest of our lives and think that after 50 years everything will have magically disappeared, it's not going to happen. Mm. But if that separation allows you to absorb yourself in a more focused way without being distracted, then that focused spiritual practice can give you a freedom from, um, uh, from the um, material attractions. So I agree with you, we would agree with you that it's not just by avoiding things or, by, uh, or even by repeated exposure to something. You see? It's not that if I stay separate from women my whole life that I'm going to overcome the attraction for women. Neither is mm. if I'm associating with women all the time, I'll overcome attraction for women. Mm. The only way I'm going to overcome attraction is by elevating my consciousness further out, beyond all of that. And if separation, to some extent, helps me to do that, then it's good. Some ideas, yes. <laughs> wow, everyone's getting into this, huh? You're, you're dressed well for the occasion. <laughs> this morning, uh, I saw you that you are sit in a high, higher place than others, in a high seat, and everyone uh, bow down to you. Every time uh, people see you, bow down to you. But why is this? Good point, good point. <laughs> I also noticed that. <laughs> well, one reason I was sitting on the high seat is just so everyone can see me. <laughs> so there's a practical reason, because I was giving a speech and I was trying to share knowledge. And the other reason why people bow down is because when one is a teacher, then they offer respect to the person who is delivering that teaching. That is a part of culture. You see, like, if you want to learn something from someone, if they have something valuable to give you, then you have to have some level of respect for them. So tomorrow, if you become accomplished also in the knowledge, or if you take the position of a teacher, we will also offer you the same respect, because that's a part of social culture. We respect our parents, we respect our teachers, we respect those who are delivering us something of value. Because when you offer that appreciation and respect, then it means your heart becomes much more open to receive the knowledge. So when we as teachers receive that respect, we understand that it's not that we are great, it's not that we are um, you know, something special, but we are simply acting as instruments of a philosophy, of a spiritual tradition that's very powerful. And because we're acting as instruments, we accept that respect, but we don't keep that respect. We pass that respect on to our teachers. So if you bow down to me, then in my mind, I'm taking your respect and I'm offering that respect to my teachers because I'm just an instrument, I'm nothing great. Is that okay? <laughs> again, again, this is very convincing, but I believe this is very convincing. This is very good speaker, and he's, he's very charismatic also. So I believe you get paid to do what you do, even though you claim to be a monk and a celibate 
and the renouncing. <laughs> Still, I believe you get paid because I saw uh, you traveling in a nice car. And well, I don't get paid. I don't have a salary. I don't have a bank account. I don't have um, a yearly holiday in the Bahamas. At least sometimes. <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, no, I don't get paid, uh, but people appreciate um, what we're coming to deliver and therefore sometimes they may invite us to a certain place and sometimes they may provide certain facilities. Um, mm. So and we I, accept that. And I guess you enjoy those. Well, we don't enjoy it, but we accept it in the spirit of service. So you're in the spirit of service. So I thought you as a monk, you were supposed to be a renouncing to renounce <laughs> pleasures and facilities and nice cars and money. But um, you're saying you can engage pretty much everything, even money and cars and holidays in service. Isn't that a contradiction? No, I mean, I don't have a Mercedes car. I don't have like a penthouse suite. I travel across the world. I spend time in different places. Sometimes it may be a big room. Sometimes it may be a small room. Sometimes I may sleep on a bed. Sometimes I may sleep on the floor. Whatever is provided, we accept it as the grace of God, the grace of the divine. To be honest, whether I'm sleeping in a bed or sleeping on the floor, it doesn't really make that much difference in terms of enjoyment because mm. real enjoyment comes from something okay. beyond all of those things. Okay. So whatever comes by the arrangement and the kindness of others, mm. we accept it. Yeah, this is interesting. And, it's uh, sort of a new paradigm because I thought that to be a monk or to be spiritual, you need to be completely against society and material life. But you're giving me a new paradigm. No, no, it's not that spiritualists don't own anything. Is that spiritualists aren't owned by anything. There's a difference. Wow. So I can still have a car and a wife and... By all means. And be spiritual. And be spiritual, yes. I don't have to give up no. who I am no, and who I own, no. my passion, my talent, no. my money. You use whatever you have, your mm. abilities, your skills, whatever things come to you by the grace of the divine, you accept that as providence and you use it for the purpose of serving others. Okay, so it's not really about being poor or becoming, uh, I don't know, a renouncement. No. Okay. This makes sense, actually. Okay, cool. There must be. I think she wanted to say something? Yes, please help me out here. Wars. Yeah, we have a plenty of uh, examples mm. in history. So, how can you explain this? So, you're saying that if religion is meant to be so good, if all of this wisdom is meant to be so beautiful, why do we see so many problems, so many wars, so many conflicts in the name of religion? Yeah. Is that your question? Yeah, actually. Yes. Well, let me share this with you. Thanks. Everything in the world causes war. People fight over religion. People fight over money. People fight over power. People fight over land. People will, in this day and age, use whatever they can and use that as a reason to fight with each other. If religion is the only thing that causes war, then that would uh, then we'd have to look back in history at the places that, where there were no religion and then expect that those would be peaceful places. Is that the case? Sometimes the biggest wars in the world were nothing to do with religion. Rather, they were all about land, money, power and resource. Religion is like a knife. The knife in the hand of a criminal will kill someone. But the knife in the hand of a surgeon can save someone's life. So is a knife good or bad? So is religion good or bad? 
Thank you. <laughs>
none of this makes me happy, I should believe in God, and he gave the rest of his life to God. Hmm. So there are examples of everything. A theist who remained a theist, a theist who became an atheist, an atheist who became a theist, an atheist who remained an atheist. There are examples of everything. You become a spiritual scientist, and instead of looking at what happens to everyone else, experience for yourself. Thank you. <laughs> something, something. I got something. I got something. So, if there were. It, no, no, no. Think about it. Remain sane, clear minded. Think. If there was God, why? Then why there is war, injustice, social, political, economical inequality out there? Why. Why did my father have to die when I was 14? That wasn't fair. And I was, that wasn't fair. There's so much injustice in this world. And uh, so where is your God? Before I give my explanation of that, I'd be interesting to hear what's your explanation. Why did your dad die at 14? Why is there so many problems in the world? Why? Give me a reason. There's no reason because there's no God. So you no don't have God. any reason. So you don't know. I just feel... You don't know. I just feel so... I just felt and I suffered so no, much. I appreciate that. But what's the Why is there suffering? Yeah, I'm, I'm asking you first before I tell you my perspective. Do you have an explanation? Yes, the explanation that is that there is no explanation. You, <laughs> so you cannot explain explanation. it. So let's just first make clear that you don't have an explanation. You can't explain. Yeah, you don't have an explanation. <laughs> no, it's just important for you to realize It's not that me first. that I don't have an explanation. Nobody has an explanation. It's just it's something you cannot explain. Yeah. So the first thing to understand is that there is a bigger picture of reality behind beyond what you're seeing. This life that we're living right now, according to the ancient teachers, is one chapter in a much longer story. This world that we're living in right now is one environment which is one small space in a much bigger reality. So the first and foremost thing to understand is that unless you broaden your vision, you won't be able to understand what's going on in the world because your perspective is too small. Imagine, for example, you went into a movie halfway through and you saw one scene of the movie mm -hmm. where someone was suffering. And based on seeing that one scene, you tried to figure out all the things that happened before and all the things that happen after, it would be very difficult because you're only seeing one scene of the movie. Mm. So the first thing we ask people as spiritual people, what we ask you to do is broaden your vision to understand that this life and the experiences we go through are part of a much bigger story, are part of a much bigger plan. So you're saying there is an explanation to why my for example, why behind injustices such as uh, a young kid like I was losing my father at such a young age, what is that explanation? Yes, these are very, very difficult things, experiences that we go through in life, but we have to also understand that the pain, the obstacles, the difficulties that we go through in life are ultimately something which, if we're able to respond and digest those experiences, can help us elevate our consciousness and can help us advance on our spiritual journey. So the ancient teachers explained that we go through difficulty, we go through suffering, we go through pain and trauma in this world, because sometimes that is a, a powerful way for us to elevate our consciousness. And therefore, uh, you may have heard of concepts like karma and reincarnation. So karma is the idea that nothing happens by chance. That everything we're going through now 
is a reaction to previous activities. Wait a second, wait a second. Oh, no, You're no, saying, no, I'll explain. This is offensive. You're saying I'm it didn't you, happen I'm by chance. Yeah, I'm coming back. You're saying you. that my father was meant to die. This is very yeah, offensive. Yeah. I'm getting hang I'm, yeah. I'm don't like this. <laughs> I don't like this. So you have to let me finish. And then, uh, so, the, so the law of karma explains that we are going through things based on previous activities. Now, karma is not used to judge people insensitively. It's not for me to judge you and say that you're, you're experiencing this, you deserve it. No, that's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is that you're going through this is difficult, is painful, and we experience and acknowledge your pain. And we wish you didn't have to go through this pain. But what we can say is even in this difficult situation, there is something through the karma that you're meant to learn from this situation that will help you to come to a happier life. And so we're not sitting here telling you that everything that happens to you is good. We're saying that everything, something good can come from everything that happens to you if you learn to respond to it and grow from it and become more wise from it. The second thing to understand is that you never lost your father and your father is a spiritual being. As I said, we need to broaden our horizon. He may have disappeared from your vision, but he continues to exist. And therefore, although things may be difficult to understand if you're just looking at it on the material level, when we go to a spiritual level, we can see there's a bigger picture. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sorry if I'm getting a little bit emotional, but I have to say that, that to believe that my father is still somewhere now and that that was not the end makes me feel at least a little better. And uh, actually what, what you said made sense and I, I don't think I can uh, argue against that. And I'm not saying I believe it because uh, there's no proof, there's no evidence, but at least I'm, yeah, I can feel, I can feel. It's more like a feeling. I don't know if it's rational or irrational, but it's a feeling that, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to think that uh, there, there might be a reason and there might be something good behind the, all the suffering that I went through that gave me hope. Sometimes when we look back in our lives, then we'll see that the times when we went through the most challenges, the times when we went through the biggest difficulties, the times when we had the most emotionally difficult experiences, sometimes they were the times when we realize the most about life. Sometimes those were the times when we grew spiritually. Those were the times which opened our eyes in terms of how to live life in a more meaningful and a better way. So we also have to understand that sometimes pain, sometimes difficulty, obstacles, these are sometimes the best teacher in our life. But as spiritualists, when someone is going through pain and obstacle and difficulty, we don't judge them. We don't try to, um, uh, we, we empathize with them, we help them, we share in your pain. But what we also try to do is help you to see how from that pain, you can also receive a very, very special uh, gift that can take okay. you to a higher place. Yeah, I have to say, it's been a long time since I had a nice conversation about my father, because all my colleagues and friends at work, friends, every time I try to bring this topic up, they're just, they seem like they don't care, they don't know what to say, they don't really have an explanation for death, and that always upsets me and makes me feel even bad about my father and my situation. You look very human, you sound very human, and. I feel like you feel like a friend to me, so that, that I appreciate, I have to say. I don't know what you guys think, but this guy is it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 
I have a point because if there is karma and reincarnation, all these things that are beyond my mind and my logic and my reasoning to comprehend, then um, it seems like I'm, I'm not in control. And I, it mm. seems that my father was taken, I could be taken. It seems that what, what power do I have? What, 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 is there a point? What, what is the meaning? What, why should I believe in anything then if it's all beyond me and it's all... Do I have free will? Is there... Should I just give up everything because there's no... Everything is beyond me or... Is there... Yeah, it's not that everything is beyond you. Life is an interplay of karma and free will. So according to your past activities, there are certain things in your life which are predetermined. You can't change the way you look. You can't change your uh, mental and intellectual capacities. Mm. Uh, certain things you're going to have to live with. That's your karma. However, what you do with those things, what you do in those situations, how you utilize your free will now, Mm. will create your future situation. So karma creates a stage. Mm -hmm. But then how you want to play on that stage using your free will is up to you. And how you utilize your free will will create your next stage. All right. okay. So it's not that everything is predestined. You still have the power to design your destiny. So there is karma, but at the same time, simultaneously, there is also free will. Yeah. Wow. This... Okay, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, I always wonder, okay, yeah. Mm. Very clever, very clever, interesting. Mm. I have to think more about this. Um, is there a book that would you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have uh, many, many books. You can read a book called the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita. Is that a religion or a religious book? No, as I mentioned, this is not a religion, this is oh. a spiritual science. Okay, I like that. So the Bhagavad Gita is an ancient book of wisdom and it gives you certain insights into who you are, why this mm. world exists, what's beyond this world. And then the Bhagavad Gita gives you certain tools, certain practices, certain uh, methods mm. of <clears> yoga <throat> or spiritual connection. Mm. And you can try it out and see mm. what it does for you and see whether you achieve some mm. kind of a higher state of uh, mm. happiness and mm. uh, spiritual consciousness. It's interesting. It's interesting. I don't know, I don't know if I understand what, what he's saying, but just by being next to him <laughs> and his smile and his energy and his friendliness, it is so rare these days. And, and just the conversation that we had about my family and my past, it, just, I don't know if I like religion and whatever you believe in, but I like you. And uh, so maybe I'm gonna give it a try, you know? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait. How much is it for the book? <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a complimentary copy, no problem. Nice, I read it. Anything else? Uh, our, our Bhagavad Gita, our God. <laughs> I just want to uh, remove the... Yeah, yeah, sure. No, no, I'm joking. I have uh, one serious question, but uh, about, uh, uh, you know, before, in, uh, in the past, the, the countries, the people were not so unified as now, like now. Now we are, like, I think all just we are the standing in some groups. Like, you know, 
Mm. To come, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we know you as Mario, but we know you as Mario. But in your life, you have different relationships with different people, and they may call you different things. Maybe your friends have a nickname for you. Maybe your mother and father call you a different thing. According to their relationship with you, they refer to you through different names because they connect to those names. In the same way, God is unlimited and he has many different relationships with many, many different people over many, many different ages. And therefore, he can have many, many different names. When the sun rises in the sky, in the UK, they call it the sun. In India, they call it Surya. But is it a different sun? No, it's the same sun. They're just using different names according to their geographical location. So the first and most basic point to understand is that there's one God who can and should have unlimited names. It's perfectly logical because even we have many names. So that's the first thing to understand. The second thing to understand is that every religion can give you spiritual benefit. One extreme is to say that one religion is right and everyone else is wrong. Another extreme is to say that every single religion is exactly the same. But what we say is a middle path, which is that every religion can give you spiritual benefit. But every religion may have a different level of detail and depth of knowledge. So, every religion, if practiced with sincerity and purity, can take you towards God. Yet amongst those religions, we can also say there is an evolution of thought. And when you study different religions, you will see how different religions are opening up different aspects of the spiritual reality. And then the third thing is, is God a person or is God an energy? God is both. God is formless and God has a form as well. But what the ancient Vedic teachers explained is that the ultimate thing that each one of us are trying to experience is love. Can you experience love without relationship? Can you experience love without exchange? Can you experience love without personality? No. Love comes from relationship. Love comes from exchange. Love comes from two people interacting with each other. And so if you want to fulfill your heart's desire for divine love, then if you approach God, the divine, in a personal form, you will feel much more satisfied and much more content. That's not to say God isn't also an energy. Yes. But in the most intimate and deep and heart-fulfilling aspect, God is a person. And how to have faith that God is a person and that he loves you? Open a relationship with him and experience it for yourself. Is that okay? Wow, actually that answers why there's so many religions in the world and I never understood why so many religions fighting against themselves. That's absurd. Religions claiming to love God and to know God and then claiming that you should love one another. I never understood. That's why I was against religions. Come on. So many priests and spiritual people claiming their religion is best and accusing others of not being the real thing. Mm. I like this broad, non-sectarian, universal understanding of religion and spirituality. Uh, that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, very nice question. So when a soul leaves this world and a soul goes to another body in another situation, 
then does that mean that there's no more connection with that soul anymore because they've taken on another identity? That's a very good question. At least we can say on a conscious level, there's no connection with that soul anymore because that soul is now playing a different part. That soul is now in a different chapter of existence, in a different place. That soul may not have conscious remembrance of the previous situation, so we can say on a conscious level, then there's no necessarily, not necessarily a connection anymore. However, we can say on a deeper level of consciousness, on an unconscious level, on a subconscious level, on a spiritual consciousness level, if we remember that soul, if we uh, connect and uh, live our life in such a way that that person is there, that, um, that they're, they're still with us, then through that deeper sensitivity of remembrance and through that recollection, we can say that we're still having a relationship, we still feel connected. Like say for example, Srila Prabhupada, he said about his spiritual teacher, that he said, at a certain time, his spiritual teacher departed from the world. But then he made a very famous statement. He said, my spiritual teacher lives forever in his words. And when I follow those words, then I'm living with him. In other words, although his spiritual master departed to another chapter of existence, and there may not have been a conscious relationship, on a deeper level, there's a relationship because your desires, your uh, orientation in life, your thinking has been synthesized with that soul and therefore there still remains a connection but not a connection in which we previously had. It's one way in, in the sense that So you, you may remember them, they've moved on, but what about them? Will they remember you? Is that your question? Yeah. yeah. Probably not. Probably not, yeah. yeah. On a, maybe on a conscious level, again, they won't. But later on, what will happen is when there's an evolution of consciousness, then, uh, and one gets into a spiritual state of consciousness, they may be able to remember and recollect things from previous lives and previous relationships and then a remembrance may come about. But yeah, in the immediate chapter of existence, maybe they won't. But that doesn't mean that relationships are severed because somewhere down the line, when the elevation of consciousness takes place, those uh, connections may be re-established in, in another way. It's important to understand why at the time of birth we forget our previous life. That is actually an arrangement of nature because unless we, forgot our unless we forget our previous life, our previous identity, our previous activities, it would be very difficult to live in this life like as a normal functioning being because we'd all be haunted, or not haunted, but just filled by all these experiences. So nature's arrangement is that that, um, that memory is um, cut at the time of birth, but it's not that later on in the sojourn or the journey of a soul, when it elevates itself, it can't recollect previous things. Mm. Yeah, okay. So just a couple of things I'd say. The first thing is that it's not that we want everyone to become a Hare Krishna, 
We want everyone to become a lover of God. We want everyone to develop pure, spiritual, deep consciousness. And if you have a spiritual practice that you're following, that you feel is helping you to achieve that spiritual connection, then we're very happy. You don't need to change anything. But if you don't, and if you're looking for something, then we are sharing this with you to say that we've experienced this. It's been amazing for us. Why not, if you're looking for something, try this out. So our goal in life is not to increase a movement or an institution or rack up numbers under the Hare Krishna label. Uh, we just want to make the world a better place by having more spiritually conscious and spiritually loving people. And if they can do that in whatever way, we honor that and we respect that and we appreciate it. Wait, wait, that. wait. So you don't want to convert people? No. Oh, I like this because I always thought religious people, they want to make, increase their numbers and make more money and ex No. So you don't really... There's actually no question of conversion because as I mentioned to you on the first day is that we're not actually teaching you anything new here. Mm. So there's nothing to convert you to. Mm. Because you're already converted. <laughs> you just mm. don't know it. <laughs> mm. So you already love God. You already have mm. this spiritual consciousness. You're already aware of everything I'm telling you. But right now it's just covered. So mm. we're not converting, we're just uncovering what's mm. there. Mm. Yeah. And uh, what would happen if the whole world becomes a Hare Krishna? Oh my God. Well, there'd be a lot of singing for sure. <laughs> and there'd be a lot of good food as well. <laughs> See, becoming a Hare Krishna, as I mentioned, doesn't mean wearing orange. Becoming a Hare Krishna doesn't mean living in a monastery. Becoming a Hare Krishna doesn't mean that you eject yourself from society. In fact, 99% of our movement doesn't wear orange. Look around. 99% of our movement doesn't live in a monastery. 99% of our movement doesn't live separate from society. There are Hare Krishnas who are doctors, there are Hare Krishnas who are accountants, there are Hare Krishnas who are post, uh, postmen and post ladies, and there are Hare Krishnas who are monks. So we just want you to find the most natural mm. and suitable situation for mm. yourself, wherever that may be, and dedicate then that in mm. serving others and making the world a better place. Mm. So I can remain as I am and yeah. get to know more about you the other You continue Krishnas? being a husband, but be a spiritual husband. Oh. You continue being a father, but be a spiritual father. Mm. You continue being a doctor, but mm. now become a spiritual doctor. Mm. In other words, just add spirituality to whatever you're doing. Mm. An imperfect Someone being. Okay, so how can we fully trust somebody who is worse than that we are? Thank mm. you. Very good question. Mm. The first thing is that it's not that you have to fully trust someone to learn something from them. When you approach a spiritual teacher, when you come, for example, to the Hare Krishna temple, it's not that you can't learn something from a teacher unless you give 100% faith. But you can give 5% of your faith. You can give 10% of your faith. You can open up your mind a little bit to hear what they're saying and then allow your faith to grow organically, mm. to grow naturally, to grow uh, spontaneously. You don't need to force yourself to abandon all your intelligence, abandon all your discrimination and just say, I'm going to follow this person no matter what. No, we're not asking for that. But what we're asking you to do is have an open mind. To begin learning anything, you have to have some faith. 
To function in life, you need to have faith. Have you ever gone on an aeroplane? Did you check who the pilot was before you got on the plane? <laughs> Did you check his credentials? Did you check he knew what he was doing? Did you check he was qualified? No, you had faith. Yeah. Some of you are married. Did you do a criminal record check on the person you are about to marry <laughs> before you married them? Just to, just to make sure. You know, that they're not some kind of serial killer or something. <laughs> no. You had a connection, you put some faith. And then how did the faith grow? The faith grew through relationship. Mm. So in a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Tadvidi pranipatena pariprasne na sevaya upadekshyanti te gyanam gyanina statvadarshina Krishna says, approach a spiritual master. Number one, pranipat. Be a little open-minded. Be open. Pariprasna, ask questions. Krishna says, ask them questions. Don't be blind. Don't just follow them out of tradition or convention. Ask questions. And sevaya, serve them. Let them serve you and engage in a relationship. And through these three things, your faith in someone will grow. Mm. And naturally, it will be a very natural relationship. You won't have to force it. So you're saying that we should always test? Yes. Yes. We say don't have blind faith. Mm. But also, don't have blind doubt. Mm. Everyone in the world is scared about mm. having blind faith. Mm. But those same people, they may be blindly doubting as well. Hmm. Faith and doubt are as dangerous as each other hmm. and they're as powerful as each other. Hmm. So hmm. we tell people don't have, you, you know, use your intelligence, but realize that faith is not opposed to knowledge. Faith is the foundation of knowledge. Hmm. This is a new paradigm. When I went to church as a kid, my, the <laughs> teachers there, they used to tell me, they used to tell me, you have to believe that, and if you don't do that, you're going to burn in hell forever. So I had this idea of a God that would punish me, and, and they weren't really offering an option to, an alternative to blind faith. Mm. Uh, so... I like this new paradigm. Um, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I have a group of people that I count. So when I go to them or to dinner or when we talk about about theology, people they look at me like why do they go and they go? Yeah, yeah, so they have a negative one. Yeah. Everyone knows Friedrich Nietzsche? So what, what was Friedrich Nietzsche's famous line? God is dead. God is dead. But do you know yes. that Friedrich Nietzsche also said something else? Yeah. He also said, I will only believe in a God who knows how to dance. <laughs> Friedrich Nietzsche also said that. I will only believe in a God who knows how to dance. Because Friedrich Nietzsche, what he was against was a certain conception of God who is judgmental, who is heavy, who punishes, who, um, who doesn't uh, have any kind of loving sweetness or personality. So he said, I will only believe in a God who knows how to dance. 
So we wish Frederick Nietzsche could be here and we could show him Krishna. <laughs> but Krishna dances. What we're trying to share with the world is that God is not a judge. That God is not some heavy personality mm. throwing thunderbolts down. Mm. God is full of charisma. Mm. God is full of color. God is your mm. best friend. Mm. You can wrestle with God. Yes. You can steal God's lunch. You can sing. Mm. You can dance with God. Wow. You can reveal your heart to God. And you know what? You can even climb on God's shoulders and have him walk you all the way back home. God is very, very great, but God is also very, very sweet. Mm. And so gradually what we're trying to share with the world is that their conception of God mm. is mm. a very, very elementary conception of God. Mm. That actually what God really wants to do is having a, have a loving relationship with you. The amazing thing mm. is Krishna, in the spiritual world, which is known as Vrindavan, they don't even believe he's God. What? They just love him because he's charming. They love him because he's beautiful. They love him because his character is so amazing that it captures their mind and imagination. And they forget that he's God because love supersedes the uh, respect of, you know, seeing someone as God. Hmm. Just like someone maybe, for example, there may be a man who's a big politician, the prime minister of the country, hmm. but when he comes home, then his son will climb on his shoulders and the prime minister will get on his four legs and act like a dog while his son, why, out of love. So at work, he's a big man. Mm. But mm. at home, he's subservient to his son mm. because it's a relationship of love. Mm. So most people only know about God at work, the big, the creator, mm. the judge. The... Mm. So what we're trying to do is share with people that God has a whole other personality which is very, very sweet, which is very, very kind, and in which God wants to serve his devotees. Mm. Okay, okay, all right. Um, this sounds very good and sweet, but <laughs> what, 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 how do we know this is not a man-made religion or a new age, spiritual, I don't know, man-made, new age, kind of hippie thing? <laughs> is it, who created this? Who wrote these books? Who wrote the Bhagavad Gita? I mean, it's, who's the authority here? So the first thing is there's a very, very ancient history to this literature, even scholars, academics, anthropologists, linguistics, linguicians have dated these literatures and shown that they're actually the oldest literatures. This is through scientific dating and mm. research. So even in the academic world, there is much to show that this is not a new religion, this is not a new tradition, these are not new books, these have been existing for thousands of years. Thousands of years? Yeah. More ancient than the Bible and the Quran? Uh, yes, existing mm. even before that. Okay. However, even if I sit here and prove to you that something is very old, that still doesn't prove to you that it's real, that right. still doesn't prove to you that it's true. Right. That still doesn't prove to you that it's authentic. No. Just because it's old, it could still be wrong. True. So therefore, I come back to my original point. In English, they say the proof of the pudding mm. is in the tasting. Mm. Mm -hmm. So if I hand you a, 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 a jar of honey, mm. then just by looking at it, by feeling it, by look, you know, you won't be able to understand its sweetness. Mm. You have to open the jar and you have to mm. taste it. Mm. So the ultimate proof that this is real, the ultimate proof that this is authentic, the ultimate proof that this is not just a new man-made kind of philosophy or religion, is that you have to begin implementing it and trying it and, mm. and see for yourself. Mm. Yeah. So, a modern sense, if for example, I have a book saying that for Hari Yoga, the best practice is Kirtan and Mahamata. Which version do you have? 
Yes, yes, very good. So I was wondering why you did the mantra. Yes, very good. So in this day and age, it said that the chanting of the mantra, the mm. sound vibration, is the most powerful. Um, then why do we need uh, deities? Why do we need an altar? Why do we need all of these things? Mm. Well, it's like this. Mm. Why do we need a temple? Why mm. do we need uh, prasadam? Why do we need mm. uh, seminars and retreats? Why do we need any of these things? Ultimately, all of us could just go in the forest and just chant the holy name and attain perfection. But why do we do all these other things? Because all of these other things support. All of these other <coughs> things help. All of these other things bring about a nourishment of spiritual consciousness. That means when we sit down and chant the name, then we can connect in a much deeper way. And so we have deities of Krishna because deities of Krishna help us to access and develop that relationship with Krishna in a much more focused way. You see, it's like this. Water is everywhere. You know that? Even in the particles here, there is water. Right? But when I'm thirsty, if I just go like this, <laughs> water is everywhere. Just open your mouth. Water is everywhere. Uh, I don't know if it's going to quench your thirst. Therefore, when you're thirsty, although water is everywhere, what you do is you go to a tap and you fill up a glass and you drink water. Because there, water is more accessible in its concentrated form. So in the same way, Krishna, God, is everywhere. But because we're not at that level of spiritual realization, when we go in front of Krishna who appears in this world in the form of a deity, it's a much more powerful and easy way to connect. And therefore, in, uh, in all of our temples around the world, we have deities because it helps us to begin to develop and approach uh, Krishna in a very personal way. Mm. Yeah. But I agree with you, deities, <laughs> deities are weird, and um, I, I also... <laughs> oh, so you like, you like them? It. <laughs> How can we You have made a profound point. You've actually said something that said in the uh, 5,000 year old literature known as the Bhagavad Purana. You've basically quoted something directly from there. The ancient verse from the Bhagavad Purana in Sanskrit, it goes like this. Archayam eva hadaye, pujam ya shradaye hate, natad bhakte shuchan yeshu, Sabhakta prakrita smrita. The ancient Bhagavad, an ancient Sanskrit book, says, if you worship Krishna in the form of the deity, but you're not able to see that Krishna is inside every single living being, then you are to actually be considered a spiritualist, but actually a materialist. If someone simply goes to the temple, offers their worship to Krishna, flowers, money, prayers, and then walks mm. out of that temple room, 
and doesn't know how to show love, mm. doesn't know how to interact and give their heart to other people and mm. see divinity within everyone, then actually they haven't elevated their spiritual consciousness. So if we're truly worshipping Krishna on the altar in a genuine way, it will translate into more and more sensitivity and love and connection with everyone and everything around us. Not just people, even the environment, everything. We'll see divinity in everything. So yeah, it's a very good observation. And it's a problem sometimes that we can become so focused on seeing mm. God in one place mm. that we don't see that God is everywhere. Mm. Yeah, good point. Mm. Thank you. Very good question. Sometimes people ask, why does Krishna and his incarnations only come in India? <laughs> like, what about the rest of the world? The first thing to understand is that when you look at the geography of the world, then what happens is that the way we see the world now with seven continents and different plates and is not what the world looked like thousands of years ago. Because you know there was platonic shifts so the geography of the world thousands of years ago was very, very different to the geography now. That's the first thing. The second thing is that not only was the geography different thousands of years ago, but the way the world was ruled was also very, very different thousands of years ago. It's explained in the ancient Vedic literatures that thousands of years ago, the whole world was actually under one empire. The whole world was known as Bharata. Bharata is a, it was a name for the whole of the universe. And uh, it's said that at that time, the seat of the empire or where everything was uh, like the capital, you know, like now in a country you have a capital. So the capital of the world at that time was what we see is today, the present day India. So that is the place which was where everything was ruled from. But otherwise, everything was one nation. It was one world. So when we say incarnations only come in India or incarnations, it doesn't, it, because we're looking at it from the geography of the world today, it doesn't actually, it doesn't compute in the same way because at that time, the whole world was India. Mm. In, or Bharat, mm. what, you know whatever you want to call it. So that's one aspect to realize that when we're talking about where incarnations appear and all of that, we have to understand we're dealing with time spans in which geography and political boundaries have changed dramatically. And uh, yeah, I mean, I could say more on this, but yeah, maybe that's, we can explore more. But just in a general way, and, and what you're saying is exactly right, that... Um, all places, all places are holy. In fact, when we go in the temple and there are deities here, then we say that's an incarnation which has come here. This whole area is a holy place. Because we don't believe that those are just statues of God. That is the divine who has appeared here. It's not just that it was a material arrangement, someone carved something, and now we brought it here through a ship and therefore it's just an idol. No, we believe there's a deeper divine significance behind that manifestation of the, of the Supreme. And therefore, yes, all of these places become holy places. Mm. Mm. So therefore, this is Villa Vrindavan. This is also Vrindavan, which is the transcendent spiritual realm. Mm. How are we doing for time? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I get out of here alive. Actually, you know? <laughs> I, like, I like hanging out with you. And uh, what do you do for dinner? Do you, uh, do you normally 
Do you eat normal food or um, yeah, do we you eat follow the best food? The best food. The best food. The best food. Healthy wow. for the body, healthy for the mind, healthy for the soul. Okay. Because um, I'm quite hungry, and I was thinking um, maybe we'd like to try some some of your food. Sure. I think we've got something set aside. Cool. Cool. Okay, so I guess um, it was a pleasure to meet you. Kishava Swami, and uh, I was an interesting conversation, and uh, I still have many doubts and <laughs> questions in my head, but I have to say that it was nourishing. I feel better now, and so thank you for your time. I'm sorry if I was a little aggressive and a little insensitive and offensive. I, I really appreciated your time and yeah, I look forward to seeing you again.